This is its own separate registry, um, and really to be good at musculoskeletal ultrasound, you'd really have to specialize in this. But we're going to go over a couple of key things that a general sonographer should be aware of and be able to pick up if you are asked to do some musculoskeletal imaging. So musculoskeletal imaging is pretty common, but as I mentioned, um, it's, it's highly specialized. You really would have to know what you're looking at um, as far as details of the muscles. But what's included in these types of exams would be imaging muscles, tendons, the nerves, ligaments, and the bursa pockets. So general sonographers are pretty familiar with muscles. We looked at the muscles in the thyroid earlier. And for the most part, muscles are going to have this hypoechoic appearance with linear strands or bands that are coursing through them. Um, and if you have your patient move that limb, you're going to be able to see the change in shape of the muscle when they move. Tendons are a little bit more difficult. Again, if you're a general sonographer and you may not have the frequency or the uh, probe that you need to appreciate the detail of the tendons, but you can kind of see um, that the tendon is like a bunch of bright bands here where they're pointing to with the arrow. And a, a tendon for this class, you need to understand, is designed to attach bone to muscle. So you've got this muscle here on the top, and then you've got bone right around there, and the tendon connects the bone to the muscle. So it's linear echogenic bands, like several echogenic bands, that are going to be easier to visualize when the transducer is parallel to the tendon. And what you're actually looking for um, is, rather than a nice smooth tendon, like this is a group of bright tendon bands here, and it's pretty thick. What you're looking for is edema around that area or some kind of a split or halo appearance, which would indicate some kind of trauma to the tendon. So a tendon is a tough band of fibrous connective tissue that connects muscle to bone, and it's capable of withstanding pretty strong tension. Tendons are very similar to ligaments and fascia lining because they're made of collagen, except the ligaments are going to join bone to bone, and they're going to be a little bit stronger. And the connection between muscle and muscle is fascia. It's a very thin lining of like, I again like to refer to that more like saran wrap. So um, for test taking purposes in this class, I want you to be familiar with the definition of what a tendon is, what a ligament is, and what fascia is. So bone, we don't usually use ultrasound for bone unless it's with fetal imaging. We just really can't see uh, detail. X-ray would be best for that. Now, an effusion. It's just like it would be if we were talking about a pleural effusion, but it's in a different location. A joint effusion would be fluid surrounding the joints. So a joint is a location where two or more bones are going to make contact. So um, within that joint, there's fibrous connective tissue and cartilage, and we're trying to point out and identify fluid collection. So honestly, what you're going to be asked to do won't be that difficult. Basically, you're going to look for fluid collections in areas, and you're always going to do a comparison to the contralateral side. Let's say you've never looked for a joint effusion um, by the rotor, rotator cuff. So you have a general idea of where that is. So you're going to look at the um, side where they're having some issues and problems. You're going to look for fluid collections, and you're going to look at the other side and see what if there's a noticeable difference. Sometimes there's a small amount of fluid in the joints, and there should be, and that's to lubricate the joints and allow a bit of cushion there. 
So you want to know what a normal amount is versus too much. So you always want to do a comparison to the contralateral side. Um, so joints have membranes, synovial membranes, that surround the joint and provide a nice cushion here. And since they're lined, the inside of this joint is lined with a fluid secreting membrane, um, when it's irritated, it's going to secrete more of that fluid. Ultrasound indications. Why do we do musculoskeletal scans? Well, the more common reasons would be trauma to the ankle if they had a possible Achilles tendon tear. Now, if they had a severe tear where the entire you know, Achilles tendon was torn, obviously you'd notice this because the muscle would be all balled up. Um, so some things are going to be very obvious. Others are more subtle, and that's what they're asking you to look for, the subtle fluid collections. Um, another indication would be shoulder pain, possible rotator cuff tear. Um, now this one's pretty common. We're looking for a soft tissue mass, like a muscle mass, um, anything that's outside of an organ but in tissue surrounding those organs. Red hot swollen. Now, most of the time, if somebody presents with a red hot swollen limb, it may very well be musculoskeletal related, but they're probably going to order a DVT study. Um, they want to rule out the most life-threatening condition first, and if that's not the case, then we start looking for other possible causes of the red hot swollen limb. So if it's not a DVT, what, what else could it be? It could be mus musculoskeletal related. And then lower leg pain, same thing. We want to rule out DVT first. And if it's not a DVT, it might actually be a Baker cyst. And we'll get into a little bit about that. So soft tissue masses are probably more common than you might believe. Uh, they may be benign or malignant. And your role in identifying these masses, let's say they're embedded in the muscle, as you're trying to determine the extent of the mass, the size of the mass, the vascularity of the mass, and whether or not there's lymph node involvement. So here's a, a large sarcoma. And you can see that um, down here in the bottom, this is pretty clear. You've got muscle here, right? You can see the fascia linings. And then this is another muscle. So this, this mass is embedded in the muscle fibers and that's what they're, they're asking you to identify they're also asking you to measure it you know what's the size of this we want what's the extent of it so you're going to get a nice measurement of it right where is it located and then of course you're going to put the color on and you're going to look for vascularity so what's the extent of the flow Baker cyst, we talked about this. It's an um, irritated synovial membrane that causes an outpouching of synovial fluid to collect behind the knee. A couple of facts about Baker cyst. We already said there's synovial fluid collections. And synovial fluid is a, um, it's a bit thicker type fluid. Um, it's, it's the consistency of, of an egg white. It's um, uh, kind of a... Um, like a, a gooey, snotty-like substance. So the purpose of it, like we said, is to cushion that blow to the joint. So it needs to be a little bit thicker than just a, a clear fluid. So synovial fluid found behind the knee, um, located in the popliteal fossa, they refer to as a popliteal cyst or a baker cyst, two names for the same thing. Uh, it's usually related to a tear or a break in that synovial membrane. These are typically found on the medial side of the vessels. And you may be asked to assist with aspiration under ultrasound guidance. Versa, they are small fluid sacs that are lined with synovial membranes um, with an inner capillary layer of that slimy fluid we talked about, very similar to an egg white. And they provide a cushion between bones and tendons and or muscles around the joint. 
It helps to reduce any friction between the bones and allows for them to move a lot freer with, without being stiff. Um, they're filled with synovial fluid, as we said, and pretty much every major joint um, is going to have a little bursa pocket. And it's better if I show you a um, visual of what this looks like. So it kind of looks like those little doggy squeaky toys here, right? You've got like this little bursa capsule. And then it's lined on the inside with the synovial membrane. Okay, like this. And then there's fluid in there. And there's supposed to be a small amount of fluid. So if you don't know what too much fluid is or, or not enough fluid, or excessive fluid, you want to do a comparison, like we said, to the contralateral side. That's the best way to assess what a normal amount is versus too much or excessive. Um, just another picture. Let's see. Um, and when somebody has excessive fluid in there, it's usually due to inflammation, and that term uh, or it's often referred to as bursitis. And you can clearly see that there's quite a bit of fluid in this area right here. And if you were to do a comparison to the other side, you shouldn't see quite as much fluid. Cellulitis, this is inflammation under the skin. Um, and they're showing you a picture here. It's called cobblestone edema. It's when you get excessive fluid in the tissue under the skin, and it kind of looks like a cobblestone street. <clears throat> So cellulitis is a diffuse infection of the connective tissue that results in severe inflammation of the skin layers, uh, the, the two layers of the skin. It's usually caused by some kind of bacterial infection that seeps in through the skin. Um, most common causes that you know it would irritate the skin would be something, some kind of crack from a burn or a cut, a mosquito bite. Um, and somebody scratched it and bacteria from your fingernails might get in. Somehow bacteria has to enter into the skin first. So sometimes when they've had catheters that were inserted um, and not cleaned well enough, bacteria can get in. Uh, most common areas for cellulitis would be on the legs or the skin of the face. Um, and they have to be treated because we don't want this to turn into a systemic inflammation where that bacteria gets into the bloodstream. So it needs to be treated with the appropriate antibiotics. Another thing we might be asked to evaluate is a hematoma, which is basically a clot of blood or a big bruise, you know, um, where a vessel was bleeding out or tissue was bleeding, but it's pretty much contained. Now, what you're going to be asked are the stages of a resolving hematoma. So let's say you happen to see a hematoma within the first few seconds and it's actively bleeding. It's going to be very echogenic. Whoops, let me color that. Give it a better color. In the beginning stages of a bleed, it's very echogenic. And then after a few minutes, you're going to get, when it starts to coagulate, okay, it's going to look more anechoic. And then after a few hours, it starts to layer off and become more complex. And the echogenic components start to become more hypoechoic. And then a late stage bleed, which could be probably days, is going to be hypoechoic and resemble more of a mass. So this is the sonographic appearance of a resolving hematoma. They start off echogenic, they become anechoic after coagulation, then they start to resolve a little bit and become more complex, and then um, it takes you know days and weeks for it to be reabsorbed by the body. It's going to look like a hypoechoic mass. So as we just mentioned, active bleed is echogenic, coagulated blood is homogeneous, anechoic, maybe even echopenic with a few echoes. Hours later, you're going to get that mixed echogenicity, and then days later, more hypoechoic. A pleural effusion. This is a 
fluid collection around the lungs. Often um, with ultrasound, we're asked to um, use ultrasound guidance to evaluate the location where the excessive fluid is. And when we do this, we usually have our patient sitting in an upright position. And I'm going to skip over to that um, slide just so you can see what I mean by upright. They're going to be sitting with their arms kind of draped over. And the reason we have them sitting like this is so that the fluid is going to collect in a pocket in the dependent portion. That way, when they put the needle in, okay, the idea is to drain the fluid but not puncture the visceral lining of that pleural cavity because you've got the parietal and the visceral layers and let me see if I can demonstrate that here so there's two layers to the pleural membrane that surrounds the lungs like this you've got the visceral which touches the organ right and then this layer, it folds on itself. And you have the parietal layer, which is the outermost layer. And then there's usually a little bit of serous fluid between the two layers. Well, when you have too much accumulating between the two layers, we call that a pleural effusion. And the treatment for a pleural effusion is a thoracentesis. So I would want you to click on the link and um, view the uh, appropriate steps in treating a pleural effusion with thoracentesis. Now, when we remove some of this fluid, there may be different colors to it. And we can do this, a um, pleural, uh, sorry, a thoracentesis can be done for two different reasons. One, it could be done for diagnostic purposes. We don't know what's going on and we're trying to sample the fluid, send it to the lab and find out what's going on. Or we can be doing it for therapeutic reasons. We already know this person has a problem and just so that we, they can be more comfortable. Because when you have excessive fluid building up around the lungs, it starts to collapse the lung and then they can't breathe. Now, if they have a bilateral um, pleural effusion, we usually do one at a time just because we want to make sure we prevent what's called a pneumothorax. As I mentioned before, we don't puncture that visceral layer while aspirating that fluid. When we're removing the fluid, if we were to puncture that visceral layer, what would happen is we'd cause a pneumothorax and air would get inside and replace where that fluid was and would have the same effect. It would collapse the lung. Now, when we remove some of this fluid, if it has sort of a greenish color to it, we might refer to it as a pyothorax. And again, if you look at the first word, it kind of tells you what most likely is made up of. Hydrothorax would be more of a, a serous fluid, yellowish color. Hemothorax, blood, okay, and so forth. So know the different terms and the different types of uh, fluid colors and what they might um, indicate. And as I said before, a pneumothorax is something that um, could be caused by performing the procedure. So if we accidentally were to puncture that visceral lining, air from the lungs is going to get trapped in between the two layers of that pleural cavity. Remember, we've got the visceral and parietal layer here. So if we've got this layer here and it folds on itself, right? But if we were to puncture this, air is now going to occupy that space. And that's just as severe as having fluid. So if that does happen by accident and you're doing the procedure, what's going to happen is your patient's going to complain of, of um, being very breathless, it's actually going to get worse their condition instead of getting better. And to confirm that they that you've caused a pneumothorax, they do a PHS just to see if the lung is in fact collapsed and there's a shift in the heart. And then what do we do if this does happen? Okay, this is a complication. Well, what we would try to do is put in a little chest tube. See, they insert this little tube here and then they suction out the air 
until that visceral lining repairs itself. And it doesn't take very long for it to repair itself. As if you're using a fairly small needle, we're talking about a little needle prick, and that should be able to heal um, rather quickly. So the chest tube, though, is necessary so that we don't collapse the lungs by escaping from the lungs into that cavity because that defeats the purpose, right? We're trying to help them breathe, and now we've also caused a complication that's making it worse. So we need to do that to help expand the lung. Another thing that um, I want you to read up on when you're doing the chapter questions, too, is they try to categorize them into different types, transudative pleural effusions versus exudative pleural effusions. And the way I kind of, and it may be not completely right, but the way I like to think of it as transitive is something more systemic that caused the pleural effusion. Systemic being um, something that, that affects the whole body, like left ventricular failure is going to uh, affect the entire cardiovascular system, uh, cirrhosis, um, pulmonary embolism that could have come from the legs. Now, exudative would be more localized, like there's a problem with the lung itself, some type of bacterial pneumonia, lung cancer, breast cancer being very close to the lungs, a viral infection of the lungs or clots within the lungs. So I like to think of it as at least it helps me to remember that exudative is more of a localized infection and transudative is a systemic condition in the body. And that's, um, that should conclude this second um, PowerPoint.